Hi everybody, this is uh, Tracy Donegan back again from Gentle Birth and the Mindful Breastfeeding Program. And I am really honored today to have, uh, to pick, pick a few brains, but uh, Dr. Suzanne uh, Colson is here to talk about biological nurturing. And her daughter also, um, Joelle, is, is, that works with her mom, is going to tell us about her work in, uh, in the UK in bringing this kind of old concept, but new for, for, for many parents around the world uh, to learn about what is biological nurturing, how is it different to breastfeeding as such, or, um, and, and how can it make it life, life easier? For, for breastfeeding mothers and babies and, and tap into their instincts and reflexes. So welcome to you both. I am really, I have to say, honored to have you both here today. I have been, I've been through this book several times. This is actually a second copy because I lost one of my earlier copies in, during a house move. And there's, every time I go back into it, there's just so much more that I, I missed kind of the first go round. Um, I think I, I first heard of your work, Dr. Colson, when I think it was just before I started my midwifery training. So I think it was about 2008, around that time. And I started my midwifery training then. And unfortunately, as impressed I was and, I, and your research and your thesis, uh, and, and I, I thought this, this just makes sense. This is how the world is going to evolve and breastfeeding is going to be made easier and more instinctual instead of 15 steps to a perfect latch, which is just, yeah, impossible when you've just given birth and your, your brain is working very differently. Um, but yes, I am really, really honored to, to have a chance to, to chat to you about your work. And so please tell me, where, where did the, the concept of biological nurturing come from or your interest in this aspect of breast, breastfeeding? Well, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us. I'm thrilled and honored to be with you today. And especially with my daughter. <laughs> it's a, just fun working with your, your daughter. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> great. We have, a, we have a wonderful time together and we advance, you know, there's no ceiling on knowledge. So I guess that I kind of discovered biological nurturing by breastfeeding myself. I've, I'm the mother of three breastfed babies and one of the founders of La Leche League France. And um, I was breastfeeding in France, all isolated, my six, eight, eight month old baby. And then I read an article that said that uh, there were going to be meetings in English in in Paris and I was living in Paris I'd been living in Paris my husband was French and so I went to these meetings with my breastfed baby <laughs> and of course there were like four people there <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was it was fantastic just to meet other people mm. and um <clears throat> I you know breastfed from baby to baby and uh, I suppose that when my last child was born, and that was in 1980, so I breastfed throughout the 1970s, when mm. nobody breastfed, so the people yeah. in Paris were my support system, and um, and of course my husband, who was all for it, so I just breastfed from baby to baby, we just all breastfed, nobody told us how to do it. Nobody said anything except not to do anything that they they said to do in maternity unit. So it, we knew that when we had our babies that we wouldn't follow follow any advice. We knew straight right. away that you know at that time they were encouraging mothers to wash their nipples before each feed with um, uh, Alcohol, alcohol that had some glycerin in it. <laughs> so nobody did that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I was so, sitting here going, okay. You have to say <laughs> <these days." laughs> you know, yeah. So the, the um, hospitals knew nothing about breastfeeding. So we just kind of did it despite them. Uh, but it, it worked. There was no real problem. I remember Klaus and Kennel, American authors, 
They published their first uh, book about bonding in 1976. Joelle was born one year later, so I've just given away your age. Thank you. <laughs> but the fact of it is that that we just did it and talked about it and, and enjoyed it. And, you know, when I left France in 1987 to do my midwifery training in England, uh, you know, I didn't know anybody who wasn't breastfeeding. Mm. And of course, in 1972, 73, I didn't know one person who was breastfeeding. So we created the breastfeeding culture in France. And that that culture exists Toujours. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm speaking of you in French. <laughs> it's bringing me back to my, my uh, secondary school French, which I enjoyed. Still, it still exists. So the, the thing is that when I took myself off to, to England to, to do my training, then uh, I learned formerly how you were supposed to breastfeed. <laughs> and oh. I said at the time, I was a student midwife. I said, well, there's no way that that's going to work. I, none of us ever did that. I mean, like, what are you talking about? A football hole? Like, what could that possibly be? Like, that looks so awkward. I don't understand why anybody would teach anybody, you know. And then I found out that a lot of the people who were doing the teaching had never breastfed a baby, but mm -hmm. they were qualified midwives. Uh, some of them were researchers and some of them were practicing midwives. And, you know, I used to say to people, well, would I ask somebody to paint my kitchen if they'd never painted a kitchen? You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it just seemed that the powers that B wanted to exclude anybody who had ever breastfed from um, kind of having an input into how you might get started breastfeeding. And at the same time, um, all of a sudden breastfeeding became an urgent public health issue. Mm. And in public health, it's, it's wonderful. And breastfeeding is an urgent public health issue, but public health, policies standardize uh, the process of anything like seatbelts. You know, yeah. all seatbelts are exactly the same and everybody knows how to buckle them. And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, seatbelts. Seatbelts have saved lives across yeah. the world. When I was learning to drive, nobody wore seatbelts and we, we actually rebelled against wearing seatbelts. So you can't really standardize uh, reproductive processes. And that's yeah. what we've done since probably the 1980s. And um, so if you want biological nurturing, it's just a backlash against this one size fits all approach, because in fact, it doesn't fit anybody's approach on the long term. Right. So biological nurturing just um, suggested different ways of doing things. And uh, along the way, I learned. I mean, I didn't just all of a sudden define biological nurturing. It's taken like 30 years to really understand uh, the components, the variables, the mechanisms uh, that uh, you can find in instinctual breastfeeding. So that's a little bit of my background. Thank you. Joelle, tell us, what, what are you doing with your mother's work and your, are you, because I, I know how, not, not dissimilar to Ireland, but the breastfeeding rates in the UK are pretty abysmal at the moment. Um, so tell me about what, 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 how are you working with biological nurturing and bringing this to more moms? Yeah, so um, I suppose that um, I have a, a similar sort of life experience of breastfeeding is my mum <laughs> and um, in fact I'm pretty grateful that my mum is my mum uh, because yeah. were, were it not for her if, you know um, I probably would have had a very different breastfeeding experience and uh, the the fact that I feel so passionately about breastfeeding is probably linked to my own experience of having yeah. breastfed my three children too over a period of um, a lot of years 
So um, I kind of, um, I was born into it, if you like, yeah, and into biological <laughs> nurturing because I was a breastfed baby and witnessed um, the the meetings at the La Leche League with all the breastfeeding moms. And I grew up with that culture of breastfeeding around me. Mm. and um and then I I it felt good so I continued it with my own family yeah uh, and um I went into public health nursing uh later in life and I loved it I loved supporting families and I loved being there for the mums but I felt very um tightly reined in as mm. far as um keeping with the standardized approach to breastfeeding yeah. and so my mom and I have been working teaching together now for several years and um trying to transmit the biological nurturing um message culture whatever you want to call it um, across a, a mostly French-speaking world, although many more English speakers are becoming kind of interested and want to learn more. Yeah. So um, I guess, yeah, we're... I think the English speakers embraced biological nurturing immediately. And I traveled all over the world uh, kind of talking about biological nurturing, but few understood that it was much more than a position i was about to say that because i think there's an understanding that it's a technique so that's why yeah. I'd, I'd love for you to tell so for the uninitiated who's never heard of this biological nurturing they've heard of breastfeeding so tell me what is biological nurturing <laughs> i mean it's easy today it's much easier uh, because it's an actual method uh to observe breastfeeding behaviors. And so in our coursework, we define behaviors, you know, breastfeeding is instinctual for mothers, but to uh, be a uh, biological nurturing companion is not instinctual. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're as health professionals, and I'm a nurse and a midwife, and as a health professional, I'm used to being the expert. And in biological nurturing, it's the mother who's the expert. <laughs> and we observe that. her behaviors in their certain conditions. For example, mm. traditionally, we have always made it so that mothers don't have their hands free when they're breastfeeding. So one hand holds the baby or an arm and the other then holds her breast at, during latch. And if you don't have your hands free, you have great difficulty expressing any instinctual behaviors. Mm. So there's a, a whole host of conditions necessary uh, to release instinctual breastfeeding. And another really important point is that instinctual breastfeeding has to do with instinctual uh, techniques and and vocalizations and and uh, uh, gestural techniques, not maternal love or is maternal instinct. So we don't necessarily talk about maternal instinct and whether all mothers have instincts or not, because that's not the question. All mothers have an innate ability to um, find and discover those techniques that work to help their babies latch and and, and uh, transfer milk. And when I just mentioned about the, the rugby hold, uh, since I've kind of, you know, come back really in, in, with my interest in breastfeeding and much more so on than I'm, I've worked, I've kind of worked in the birth field for about the last 20 years and I'm, uh, but as you know, as a midwife, breastfeeding is always kind of within my remit. But it was again only a couple of years ago, and I thought, you know, again, when you talk to parents, and it's just so we've just overcomplicated, yeah. All and and keeping keeping women in that you know thinking brain, which means they can't access their own that, that those innate behaviors right. when somebody is standing there, you know, saying, you know, 
chin to chin first and and yeah, this exactly. prescriptive because wow. it's like I read it recently and I'm thinking I, I'm you know I've had enough sleep last night I you know I I'm not recovering from postpartum but I'm just reading that list of I was like I'm confused now so you imagine a a new mother with a you know you know two-day-old baby that's left on her phone looking for you know how to latch and we've yeah. just we've we've disempowered mothers because we've ta- we've said your your you know innate knowledge is not valuable. You have to follow the checklist because mm. the authorities have created the checklist, and that's where you know you've been coming from with this whole you know prescriptive clinical step that's by right. step instead of mm-hmm. actually trusting that women know what to do if they're given. And I think it's not even about teaching; it's about take m- removing the barriers. So that keeping mothers and babies together, they'll do what they're supposed to do if we can kind of keep our hands off. And it reminds me of, as you're no doubt well aware of Dr. Michelle O'Don and his, uh, his, you know, he always talks about undisturbed birth. And and for me, when I, when I talk to other midwives and birth professionals and I say, isn't it amazing like that we've, we've learned so much about undisturbed birth and and what what mothers need to get into that headspace and go to labor land and, and it's really about us stepping back and as they say in the UK the UK midwives drinking tea intelligently and not jumping in to if if they're, everyone's coping so then the conversation goes on to then so as you know, midwives and doulas, we know that if, if the mother is coping well, we're really standing back and we're supporting and but we're not jumping in to say, you know, well, you need to stand for 10 minutes and sit in the bowl for 20 minutes and and follow all these instructions. We trust that she she will follow her body's leads. But then as soon as the baby's the born, is, we stop um, and it's like, no, they don't know what to do now. Now we have to get our hands in there because we can't trust the mother to know what her baby needs. And we've, we've, there's no undisturbed breastfeeding as such until biological nurturing. The problem is that, that um, it's largely understood that giving, or, or largely misunderstood, that giving birth and breastfeeding are um, in fact um, uh, uncontrolled processes, involuntary processes, and you can't help an involuntary process. Now, it is true that sometimes mothers need help in both the birth and the breastfeeding context, and I'm not saying that they don't, but most mothers don't. And, um, you know, even if you don't want to breastfeed, you will produce milk. And even if you don't want to breastfeed, you will have these skills unless those skills are suppressed. So how do we suppress them? Well, we trigger thinking. I mean, it's just written an article about thinking and it's called Unthinking Breastfeeding. And it's going to be published in the ELACTA journal, which is, the, I think, the counterpart to ILCA in the United States. Oh. This is going to be in um, in Europe. It's called ELACTA and not ILCA. And they have a journal and I've just finished writing an article for them. They're lovely and very open to, to biological nurturing. And it's called unthinking breastfeeding because mm. with, we now we, like I, I picked up on this term that you use coping if the mother's not coping well. So coping insinuates that it's difficult and a problem, mm. you know? So I have to cope with my life and it's so stressful and so horrible yeah. and everybody's going to judge me on how I cope with it. Why should giving birth and breastfeeding be kind of mm. uh, talked about in those terms? Coping with breastfeeding just makes it sound like it's just going to be terrible right from the onset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I love breastfeeding, you know, breastfeeding yeah. is, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. Mm-hmm. And if you look up, you know, uh, problems, breastfeeding problems, you get millions of hits on Google or PubMed. If you look up the joy of breastfeeding, 
You get very few hits because nobody mm. ever talks about how much fun it is. I guess it's because we patho pathologize everything yeah. you know so so when i say coping I, when I, i'm thinking about the cut within the context of labor and you know if if a, a mother is you know she's following her you know instincts and and whatever sensations her body are directing her to move in a certain way it's just that when when the baby is born that idea of trusting the mother to follow her instincts just seems to be that's off the table now and even midwives and doulas who really understand the concept of of hands off birth and and being much more of a a witness than needed to be in there unless there is something that comes up it just feels like we've it, there's this cut off when the baby's born that and it's not every midwife it's not every doula but it just feels like that that con continuation of yeah. we trust the mother to know what to do if we can remove the barriers and and let her settle in with her baby that that we instead of as we all know, the check to get baby latched to get you down to postpartum. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very hurried. And it's also yeah. um, midwifery or nurse driven. Um, and yeah. it's uh, in, in many ways, it, it, it disorients mother mothers because they, you know, it takes a while to kind of even pick your baby up if you're in a vertical position usually you just kind of touch your baby and explore your baby and then you pick your baby up so there would be very few mothers who would spontaneously kind of uh give birth lying flat on their back and then um put their babies far away from the breast to see if they find the breast by themselves in an hour so all of that has been great, I suppose, to highlight the neonatal competencies. But yeah. uh, it hasn't done much for uh, increasing breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding duration. Um, and there's a lot to be said for just not doing much after birth, just being there, you know, um, and not interfering in what she does because every mother will greet her baby in mm. a way that she'll remember the rest of her life instead yes. of standardizing uh, this rush to get the baby on her body and skin to skin contact. It doesn't make much sense. Although skin to skin contact is something that I promote. I'm not saying that I don't promote it, but most mothers are naked anyway, so I don't see why we have to kind of take over from mothers. Yeah, and an interesting point when when I in your book about skin to skin and how that that I think there's and I I am absolutely guilty of this as well before I I knew better that there's there's going to be women out there who are really not comfortable with sitting in, in the postnatal ward or even their own home sitting fully naked and the fact that you can do this with, with lightly clothed I was like and I, I was kind of like you know I beat myself up quite a bit for that for thinking why didn't I why didn't that penny drop for me that skin to skin it, that we can also trigger these reflexes and these behaviors if mom and baby are lightly clothed so I think for there's mothers out there who didn't get that immediate skin to skin or felt weird about it that that not to be really, to to really explore that and it's there's ways to do this that is supportive of, of kind of everyone's feelings and and dignity and but one thing that I thought was really fascinating in your in the book about about the breast crawl because there is once this kind of you know made it to the mainstream it was like now everybody's got to do the breast crawl and often these videos sometimes you'll see moms that are flat yeah. and these babies are put like way like I'm thinking baby has just moved house very suddenly he's probably just as exhausted as as the mother and you're gonna the way I describe it as it's like you've you've just run imagine you were running a marathon and you finish the marathon and then they say congratulations but to get your medal and like the real finish line is another two miles down the road <laughs> which is I think is what we're doing when we put instead of putting the baby on the breast cheek to breast we put them way up under here or way down here. And we're like, oh, the, and to watch the baby crawl. I'm like, no, no, 
That's just, why, why are we it making it harder? It doesn't make sense to do that. But there's some, there's just so much that doesn't make sense. Certainly one aspect that we've really been emphasizing in our, in our coursework together mm. is uh, that babies breastfeed optimally when they're asleep. And of yeah. course, this is um, because they suck and swallow from around 12 and a half gestational weeks uh, constantly in their sleep. And that mm -hmm. few babies are actually ever in a calm, awake state during gestation. So I thought when I was pregnant that anytime my baby moved, that the baby was awake. Now that's not true. We mm. move in our sleep and these movements are spontaneous. They're not yet reflexes, although sometimes they can be triggered by sensorial uh, stimulation that is exterior to the baby's body. But most of the time they're triggered uh, through uh, an accumulation of of um, nervous movement in the spinal uh, cord. And that releases spontaneous, uh, a whole host of spontaneous movement that I have identified in my doctoral work as, um, as reflex movements. Uh, now I'm changing that somewhat because they're not reflexes as much as they are just um, spontaneous uh, and endogenous movements that um, initiate breastfeeding, like mouth opening, mm. or uh, just spontaneous sucking. If you observe babies, because for some reason, we think that when babies are born, that we should put them in a plastic box next to the mother's bed. And that's called rooming in. Mm. Um, that did increase rates of breastfeeding, and I don't deny that. But that's not the right address because mothers miss those spontaneous move, movements and the baby's then no longer on the breast to transform the spontaneity into a reflex. Mm. And the touch right. of the breast then triggers mm. the reflex and that goes ex rapidly after birth unless you suppress that. If a baby in... Uh, a plastic box or the the cradle, if you want to call it a cradle, next to the mother's bed, opens uh, his or her mouth spontaneously, but the mother misses that. She doesn't see that and the baby's yeah. asleep. Mm -hmm. Then if the baby does that four or five times and there's no recompense, there's no sensorial input, then the baby stops doing it. Mm -hmm. And around about the third postnatal day, all of a sudden, the mother's milk volume increases and uh, the baby is completely disoriented because the baby hasn't been sucking and swallowing like it did every hour mm -hmm. <laughs> in fetal life, once or twice, maybe punctually all the time during fetal life. That has been discontinued for 48 to 72 hours. So this idea that babies feed extremely well when they're asleep, and we call that indeterminate sleep, because mm -hmm. the baby moves from one sleep state to the next rapidly. And in biological nurturing, we call um, a drowsy a sleep state, whereas everybody else calls, or the neuropediatricians uh, call drowsy an awake state. Hmm. But in fact, when you're drowsy, you can either return to sleep or you can wake up. In biological nurturing, you always return to sleep. <laughs> the baby. The baby does. <laughs> the mother doesn't. Yeah, to speak to the mother. Jean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's when I when I talk to other mothers about about this aspect of being of nursing while baby is asleep. For me, I think it's especially for postpartum. You know, you've just let's just say you've had a standard hospital birth you're now home and just to to have you know to have baby uh, as I say close to the the baby buffet as much as possible that you're not uh, especially first time because I remember this the panic and 
anxiety of constantly checking to see is he moving is he awake because if he's awake then then I'll feed him but other than that I was like oh okay and I didn't have, if with with this approach you don't have if baby is in the right address we don't mm. have to worry about you know the cues and, and recognizing those cues because everybody tells you oh you'll you'll know your baby and you know what cry means what but when it's your first baby, you don't believe any of this. You're like, you just feel like you are incompetent, you know, especially in the early days. But I think just that confidence that, you know, and, and this fixation about getting baby's birth weight back. And here in the U.S., it's just really, there's no, there's no public health nurse coming out to see you. You're, you leave the hospital and then you, you're actually encouraged to come back within two days to see your pediatrician. Oh, wow. wow. So there's no, nobody's, and actually even in, um, just a quick aside, in Ireland now, the public health nurses are, don't have to have any midwifery background or any breastfeeding training. They don't even have to do like the, the 20 hours. So again, we're kind of, we're trying to, it's breastfeeding week in Ireland at the moment. So we're, we're, this is all kind of, you know, we're that trying to address what, what's going on within the community. But I do think that that confidence that comes with, your baby is nursing, you know, those first few days, if baby's kept at the right address, that birth weight's going to fly up. You won't have to be in your head and anxious, worried about, you know, waiting for baby to wake because you know you have to. The book says you have to get all these feeds in within 24 hours. And I think it just, it, it's, you're, you're in, in, really inducing that oxytocin system in the mother so that it's yeah. it's suppressing anxiety. She is building her own confidence in her mothering, and but I think I do agree when, when we separate the baby. I call them a casserole dish because that's what it reminds me of. Your my mother would make lasagna in a big glass dish, and I, that's exactly what putting them in the, in the casserole dish over there, and and then we we miss the, those those cues, and uh, so that's so well, yeah. I was just about ready to bring up this really valid point. <laughs> that the mother needs to be awake doing biological nurturing. Mothers don't sleep. Babies sleep. And the mother um, watches over the baby. Wa yeah. Yes. Watches and protects the baby. Mm -hmm. So biological nurturing is done during the day. You know, we, we actually make it so that uh, we lengthen the time that it takes babies to find a circadian uh, rhythm because we don't breastfeed them during the day because we say they are sleeping mm. and that we should leave them in the, the cot or the- Don't the wake them. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> babies who are on the mother's body where their head is sleeping cheek to breast, they actually breastfeed because of these spontaneous movements that I was talking about. But the mother is awake. Yes. And, uh, you know, you always need someone to protect the baby, but her degree of recline enables her to see her baby. We're yes. so often in skin to skin contact. She is placed in a degree of recline where uh, she can't see the baby's face. And then, of course, yeah. if the baby stops breathing or there's a problem, she's blamed because she didn't notice it. But we're the yeah. ones who placed her in this position with the baby yeah. lying flat on top of her. And so those are not good positions to use, but they're still widely used in skin to skin contact. Well, and all these uh, things that Suzanne's been talking about, these are all the components of biological nurturing, yeah. which always brings us back to what it is. And for a health professional, we're always talking about a method of observation of behaviors. Mm -hmm. So if a health professional, rather than teach a mother how to correctly attach the baby to the breast, leading in with the chin, rather than speaking anything about how to lead in with anything, mm -hmm. she observed the behaviors and took notes on, oh, well, let's see these endogenous, spontaneous behaviors. Are they, which ones are present? And let's see this degree of recline that the mother has. Can she see her baby? Can she, is she uh, able to just have her hands free? 
and not have to apply any pressure to her baby's back to hold the baby in position? Can she comfortably make a little nest around mm. her baby or spontaneously trigger any of the reflexes? So all of these components that we're discussing are part of the health professional's role in uh, observation. And this would mean that mothers and babies are kept together, just like you were saying. And yeah. we start with that separation with the baby being, I can't remember if it was the casserole or the lasagna um, <laughs> in the in the glass dish. Someone's <laughs> getting fed. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having some lasagna. <laughs> I know. Think of yourself no, over here. <laughs> it is kind of amazing. I guess that the observations that we teach are universal, always mm. present in all um, uh, dyads, mothers and babies who are instinctually breastfeeding, and that the the techniques are instinctual for the mothers. And we've identified and and show in really salient video clips uh, how all mothers, for example, all mothers or anybody, fathers, neighbors, children, you know, family, cousins, anybody who does biological nurturing places their baby in exactly the same way. Mm. So that is an instinctual behavior. That's what we're talking about. So we're, again, we're not talking about instinctual love or maternal yeah. instinct. We're just talking about what people do all people make a little nest around their babies. Sometimes that nest holds the baby's uh, bottom and sometimes it doesn't. All mothers kind of veil their babies. Uh, and they, of course they can't do that if they haven't got their hands free. And there's yeah. continuity of these behaviors. All mothers, when they're pregnant, kind of veil their tummies. <laughs> they're constantly interacting and they're mm. constantly going mm -hmm. like this across their um uh, their rooms and communicating if i if i the show bump. you that well <laughs> the bump in, in english i never yeah. use the, yeah. the bump <laughs> but but you know a pregnant mothers are constantly doing this yeah. and and this and kind of playing around with their babies mm. and communicating with them and protecting them and mm. i think that uh, we show really pertinent, um, convincing vi video clips yeah. of mothers doing the same thing uh, when they're breastfeeding. All mothers kind of trigger their baby's uh, feet reflexes. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because that is something that I hadn't come across before. And when you see, you know, the traditional or I call vintage breastfeeding positions where you've got baby's feet swinging out here in yeah, the air right. and and it, and just to to support the baby's feet and and trigger those reflexes can you tell me a little bit about the reflexes because i think most people have heard of you know the suck swallow and maybe the palmer mm -hmm. grass but i think and rooting but tell me a little bit about what other reflexes did you find that are important for for breastfeeding or getting it started Certainly in biological nurturing, and this is something I've learned since I uh, submitted my doctoral work, but all babies in biological nurturing uh, are in close ventral continuous contact. And in traditional or vintage, if you want to call breastfeeding positions, that's a, a, a kind of a funny word, mm -hmm. but um, in those positions, the the um, ventral contact is uh, irregular and discontinuous. And continuous ventral contact stimulates the baby's navel. And that releases a reflex called navel radiation. And neuropediatricians talk about this reflex in different terms than somebody like Bonnie Bainbridge, who is uh, a yoga teacher and a, dan a dance instructor. But she also has evoked this reflex as some other um, uh, psycho behavioral psychologist, I think. And I'm sorry, Dr. Hong, just to interrupt you for a minute, just for, for someone who isn't, who's just learning about biological nurturing, when you when you say ventral, what do you mean baby is tummy? tummy? So baby's tummy to, to mom's tummy. Yeah, the, yeah. the whole kind of area from the, the whole neck. Body. The neck to the pubis. 
So in, in, in traditional um, correct latching techniques, very often we encourage a discon discontinuous contact whereby the baby is kind of taken away from the breast and brought closer to the breast and brought away mm. from the breast yes. and closer again to try and trigger the mouth opening so that the baby can grasp or uh, take yeah. or latch onto the breast. And in biological nurturing, it's just the opposite. The baby is on top of the breast and stays on top. And any movement that the baby does is in constant contact, uh, mouth, cheek, neck, chest, tummy, and even the rest of the legs and the feet. Well, there's a, a, a plantar support, which is really important. And of course, we're basing all of that on previous work done by neuropediatricians examining the origin of movement in the fetus. So there's continuity in from fetal movements, all movements observed in the in the fetus, you will observe uh, in the first day that the newborn baby is born. Mm. And you you mentioned in the book again an, an aspect that I was I hadn't considered before and uh, I hope lots of midwives will go get your book after <laughs> they, they've seen this because I learned so much and there was you spoke about the lie and attitude and yeah. I had which is usually is part of midwifery and when I thought oh what that makes sense and and I saw a picture came up on social media the other day of this tiny newborn on on the mom's now fully clothed but in this you know curled up position and I was like no nah, yeah so yeah and it just kind of the clicks you know can you tell me a little bit about baby's position within the womb and then because I always think of the idea of of drinking or eating sideways I don't know it just doesn't make sense that we that we're putting babies in the side because if I were to lie down and try to drink exactly. my tea, yeah it's it's yeah I don't, like, yeah but yeah can you tell me a little bit about what you find, found with that. Lie is the direction of the position or the orientation. So even if you have, if you have uh, the mom, the mother's uh, body and the baby's body together, the baby can change orientation or lie. So the baby in the womb lies uh, longitudinally and all midwives know that. Yeah. And, or obliquely. And those are the normal lies. Uh, a baby who lies transversely like this, if this is the mother's womb, mm -hmm. and the baby who lies like this cannot be born but by cesarean section. So it's yeah. called an abnormal lie in midwifery language. So uh, it's interesting to, to find out, discover that from one day to the next, we force our babies into an, what was considered an, an abnormal, abnormal way, way to mm. orient their bodies to breastfeed. And not only do we do that, but we force them to do it because we sit upright. And when we sit upright, we don't use gravity. So we must hold our babies yeah. to our breasts, applying quite strong pressure. And the more the baby weighs and the older the baby gets, the greater the pressure. So that this is actually forcing the baby into a position that yesterday he wasn't in at birth and maintaining that where we try to suppress his movements mm. that these are kind of like uh, general movements that all babies make with their arms and their legs and they go hand in hand with finding the breast. So we suppress that because mm. gravity pulls the baby away from the breast. It's a bit like uh, swimming. And a lot of people talk about the breast crawl, but in the traditional positions, we use um, uh, the breast crawl actually takes the baby away from the breast because gravity brings the baby mm. away and so it's like the baby is doing the back crawl, mm. not the forward, the back stroke. Because when we, you hold the baby, yeah. applying, then the baby's arms move back 
because gravity is constantly bringing the baby yeah. away from the breast and yeah. also making so that there's no continuous uh, ventral contact. Ventral meaning chest, maybe from the sternum to the pubis for both mother and baby. And just to go ahead. Back, just to come back to this uh, navel radiation, because I I don't think Susan finished the the reflex um, uh, action. Which so when you have this constant ventral stimulation, as described by numerous people, these yeah. uh, psych uh, uh, across disciplines, behavioral mm -hmm. psychologists. Um, pediatricians uh, dancers and yoga teachers um so the 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 movement originates around the navel with this stimulation and then the movement kind of goes out to the limbs to the legs the arms right. the sacrum and the head and because the the baby has this kind of this anchor almost that kind of keeps his navel in close apposition, the movements become much more fluid. Yeah. And oh, right. uh, some neuropediatricians like Prechtel that Susan has used a lot in uh, her work, uh, describe fetal movement as very elegant and gracious. <laughs> so we talk a, a lot about this during our certification program because uh, at birth, all of a sudden, the neonatal movements are described as being very jerky. I was and... going to say, yeah. <laughs> or writhing, even Pre Preshtel describes them as writhing or fidgety movements. Yeah. But he examines them when the babies are lying on their back. We are not doing, back yeah. Feeders. We yeah. are ventral feeders like puppies and cats and and uh, other mammals that always feed on their tummies. And we're part of, of those, uh, those ones, those mammals that feed on, on our tummies. Mm. And we feed uh, particularly well when we're asleep. Mm. Uh, those awake states take a while to develop. Yeah. And of course, babies feed beautifully well when they're awake too, but that's not the issue. The issue is that it's in it's involuntary action for the baby, so that a lot of people distorted my research findings, suggesting that the movements were um, signs of hunger. They have obviously nothing to do with hunger. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, the eyes move under closed lids, and that's a, a hunger sign. That's not a hunger sign. That's a sign that the baby is in light sleep or paradoxical right. sleep. And so we want to maintain the baby in a sleep state um, so that he, babies suck and swallow pretty constantly mm. throughout gestation in sleep states. And they have this elegance of, of movement that has been really described and validated uh, by many across disciplines. Yeah. As soon as the baby's born, Oftentimes we examine them when they're on their backs. We're not back babies. Hmm. It's not their best performance. It's not their yeah. best performance. <laughs> and the, the neuropediatricians have actually um, uh, kind of created a, something called op observing the baby and the best performance of the baby. But then right. they, they put the babies on their backs and we're not mm. back, back babies. And we don't perform well as babies on our backs. And that needs to be recognized. But with the back to sleep uh, campaign, for example, mm. um, we have now come to a time in our lives when we're encouraging mothers to play with their babies and place their babies on their tummies. It's called tummy time to uh, enhance motor development. Well, biological nurturing is natural tummy time. Yeah. The baby mm. is constantly yeah. in close ventral contact. The baby is in security during yeah. that contact because the mother is awake. So yeah. biological nurturing is not a night strategy. Yeah. It's much more to be done during the day, which is going to yeah. hasten 
the uh, development of the baby's circadian rhythms. Because if we keep babies asleep in cots during the days, well, and then feed them all during the nights, well, we're just emphasizing <laughs> uh, nocturnal uh, feeding, which is not, of course, we're going to breastfeed the baby during the night, but those breastfeed shouldn't take a lot of time because the constant feeding during the day yeah. that babies do with biological nurturing actually conditions the reflexes earlier. And therefore, night feedings are much easier. And you know, if, if there was ever a trial done on how, how, here's a way to really help mothers, breastfeeding mothers get more sleep. I think this would be like part and parcel of every breastfeeding class, you know, because it's, there is, I, I was uh, speaking to someone earlier on today talking about the, the whole, you know, parent infant sleep conflict, you know, the expectations that we have in the Western world of sleep, but this obviously would, could be a, you know, a solution to not just, you know, encouraging, you know, parents to s safely bed share and, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it is fascinating. Oh, I, I just, that's just fine. I wanted to say the tummy time thing, because when yeah. uh, a lot of parents have find it when, because again, you know, and I, and I did it as well. I had the things I had to, I had to go to baby massage and tummy time and all of these different things that yeah, my activities with the baby and going to, I think it was baby massage or baby yoga and those, and the whole focus on tummy time and some babies really not liking it. But I think, no. but if they're doing biological nurturing and this, and if they're used to this, this ventral contact with at least with mom, that maybe tummy time, if it's being done like on the floor, or baby has just had a nice feed or whatever, that the biological nurturing could support that tummy time for those babies that maybe you no, know, who kind of grew well, up not to like it because they never experienced it. It would be for every baby. Um, yeah. There's certainly a strong argument to suggest that starting out breastfeeding uh, in biological nurturing makes good sense. I mean, for example, when we hold our babies in the traditional um, transverse lie across the mother's body, um, we completely block the baby's um, kind of cross limb coordination. And in biological nurturing, you see that right from birth that babies, you know, right arms and left legs move together. Yeah. And so that enhances early coordination and crawling, for example. So yeah. that is a very important aspect. But not only do we do that for the baby, so the, the babies have one side that's completely blocked that that mm -hmm. one side can't move. And then oftentimes we suppress the arm that's free because it seems to get in the way because gravity keeps pulling it away from, yeah. the, from the mother because she's sitting upright or she's sideline. Yeah, so that I did that breast fighting. Would you talk a little bit about that? The way some newborns mm -hmm. seem to fight the breast and how does biological nurturing resolve that? It's always a question of gravity. And part of the role of the the person accompanying the mother, the health professional, is to see if gravity is helping or hindering because mm -hmm. it's always a question of using gravity as a help, as a stimulation, because gravity then kind of uh, glues the baby to the mother's body. And of course she makes sure that the baby doesn't fall off right? She's awake and she, mothers take the initiative in biological nurturing. First of all, they place their sleeping babies on their body and they keep them there. Yeah. And then they don't have to look for signs because they feel them and they mm -hmm. just naturally react. And when gravity helps, then mothers have their hands free so they can do lots mm -hmm. of things, you know? Um, it's so easy to tell you the truth that you wonder why yeah. we have such a fuss about breastfeeding. Um, so, but, so tell me what what are what are you both doing at the moment? Is there training that people can take, or tell us a little bit about kind of where is biological nurturing going? Oh, everywhere! <laughs> Great, that, that's what I want to hear. Limitless. <laughs> we are. It's, it's, 
extremely extremely busy right now we are particularly busy it's a wonderful time of the year uh, <laughs> well yeah i mean we do we do six days training so people initially said oh my goodness uh, i can't imagine spending six days discuss uh, discussing a position but there's you know six co basic components and then all the mechanisms that m make it work. Yeah, there's prerequisites, there's neutralizing uh, neocortical inhibition, uh, ensuring high oxytocin pulsatility, and then looking at all the kind of universal characteristics that are always associated with instinctual breastfeeding that are highly suppressed in the classical or vintage ways of, of showing and telling mothers how to breastfeed. So we do that six day workshop. Mm -hmm. We're just organizing a conference. Joelle's organizing quite an interesting conference. We're doing a tremendous conference in Paris. So it's uh, gonna be uh, with uh, real people all together <laughs> sharing the same space, Lovely. which is gonna be absolutely fabulous. Um, and we are, uh, our theme or our, um, our subject is uh, neonatal hypoglycemia. And, and promoting um, exclusive breastfeeding from birth. Well, and particularly during the, the first few days while mothers are staying in the maternity units, uh, because very often uh, babies are given a, a complement of um, cow's milk protein substitutes. Needlessly. Um, needlessly. Yeah. So we, we have some really wonderful speakers and uh, Dr. Jane Holden, who is a pioneer in, uh, she's a consultant neonatologist in London. And she has been doing this work for oh, years. Know, her, first, her first research, her doctoral four research decades. was published in 1992. And in fact, I had the great honor of being able to work with her in London. Uh, on a research project where we, in fact, supported exclusive breastfeeding for late preterm babies. Um, but I had followed her work very closely for uh, term babies, healthy term babies. And so she's coming to, to speak. Yeah. Um, and then we have some other people kind of saying how biological nurturing has worked in their own units. Yeah. And a doctor who is going to address how we weigh babies too much you know so and then oh. compliments for whom and why is the title mm. of his presentation so so that should be a terrific conference fun. we have um, a zoom event at the end of november in english so it's going to be an introductory day on about biological nurturing uh, the and if you send me all the details, and I'll uh, I'll make sure everything goes up oh, with this interview delighted. as well, so yeah. people yeah, can would, find you very easily. That would be fabulous because we do you. a lot of work now in Zoom. Yes, because so yeah. many people are reluctant. <laughs> yeah, to, well, uh, to, it's so convenient to stay convenient. at home and tend to yeah. the kids and put mm. the recording on pause for an hour while you do the school run. So yeah. It makes really good sense for a lot of people, but the new um, world. we do a lot of we, online. We try to do one, at least one training session in um, uh, when people attend. Yeah, in personal attendance. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and one conference maybe a year where people attend, but um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Future. We'll see where it takes us. But it's a, it feels like a really exciting time right now with a lot of people interested all over the world. Yeah. Uh, so you're in the States and that's just fabulous. And we have people um, in Israel right now who are just kind of uh, waiting for can't you. wait <laughs> to take the certification. Yeah. In Taiwan. People in Taiwan. <laughs> And the certification oh, is it's people. in person, is it? So some of it will be the conference is in person in Paris. Is that what your question was? Yeah, no, the for the actual certification, because I know I, I have a lot of birth professional oh. followers who so it can be done online. Yeah, it can a, be lot, done online. a lot of our certification is online. And as Susan was saying, you know, initially it can seem like 
six days is a huge amount of time to be online, you know, six or seven hours a day where we have, you know, some breaks. But in fact, we we get to the end and it feels like we have just, hardly begun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have now created a, a real following, a network of over 350 people who um, are trained in biological nurturing. Some of them, maybe over half of them are certified, but they have to go through quite a stringent examination um, to, be to be certified. <laughs> okay. And um, it's a new paradigm, isn't it? And yes. So, you know, you have to be able to define behavior if mm. you're using a new method of um, behavioral observations. Right. Yeah. So it, it doesn't come instinctually for us health professionals to use biological nurturing. Yeah. Um, but we are going to be having um, an in English speaking training session. Certification here that in starts in September. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, send me all the details and I will share them with you. Before we wrap up, I just, you briefly touched on it and it was, it's like the last line in your book. You're talking about veiling and then you say, watch this space. So you didn't mention it there. Can you tell me what, what do you mean when you talk about veiling? How mothers veil their baby? You, you mentioned briefly about veiling. We veil our bumps. Like it's a protective mechanism that we think to do. That was our interpretation that as soon as babies latch, mothers kind of, they go from the top, from head to toe, or they do different kinds of things like this, these variations. Some mothers kind of stroke the trigemini, trigeminal mm. um, ganglion mm. here, and they have these instinctual responses that all mothers do as soon as they have their two hands free. So as soon as they're in biological mm -hmm. entering positions, yeah. then gravity helps. They have their hands free. The degree of maternal recline enhances mother baby gazing. Mm -hmm. so that, and that of course increases oxytocin pulsatility yeah. um, that leads to uh, reduced kind of neocortical inhibition, you know, Neocortical inhibition is this break that keeps us civilized. So yes. that I'm careful not to say something or do something that mm. would be politically incorrect. I suppose that's a term that that we we use or have used recently. Yeah, um, it keeps us civilized. So that uh, in when you have a reduction in neocortical inhibition. Uh, involuntary acts then are able to express themselves in a variety of different ways. Well, and that's what I was thinking as I was listening to you describe veiling. I thought it it's one of those behaviors that mothers just can't help but do. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so delicious it's not... to have your baby yeah. drinking your milk and mm -hmm. And have that feeling that oh it's it's all me it's all you know I'm yeah. the only person that can do this yeah yeah and you can't help but touch and you can't help but just kind of stroke yeah. your shin yeah. and yeah. that's what that veiling is and I guess you called it veiling because it it's a it is like a protection it's a it must be a maternal um I call it it's like a, it's like a your cut your it's like an imaginary cloak you know you're cocooning yes, your that's baby right. you know that's that, exactly yeah. right I called it veiling in honor of a midwife uh, I was teaching in biological nurturing in in um Bristol and uh there was this midwife listening to me describe this and she came to see me afterwards I don't remember her name but we had lunch together and she she got these big tears in her eyes. And she said, you know, I had a preterm baby and I felt like I wasn't a very good mother until you described veiling. She said, I'm calling it veiling because I don't at the time, I don't think I called it veiling. I just called it a, a, a just a, a gestural expression that mothers had. And she said, it's like veiling. And she showed me all these drawings that she had made during my talk. And where she she said it's like a protective 
uh, movement. And she said, I did that with my mm -hmm. baby. I'm feeling really emotional just talking about yeah. it. And yeah. She said, she said to me, and that was, that's the first time I, I felt like I was a really good mother because oh, I, I did that, you know, mm. so I thought, well, I'll, I'll call that veiling in honor of this midwife oh. who was and is still, I'm sure, a fabulous mother to yeah. her baby. Isn't that amazing? Because that and nobody taught it to her. No, like it was, yeah, it came from here, you know, and yeah, that's fabulous. That's right. So that's what I mean by, but you can't express that if you can't see your baby. Yeah. And you can't teach it. You and, can't mm -hmm. teach me how to do it. <laughs> no, you can't teach me how to do it. No, we're yeah. just yesterday we were in a, finishing up a Zoom with a group, and I, I, I showed a video where I, you know, I told this mother her phone was ringing. And she looked at me as though I was completely out of my mind. And I was like showing how she was a breastfeeding mom. <laughs> she was she, breastfeeding it was a video baby. from many oh. years ago. <laughs> and I was, I, you know, I, I guess I didn't have <laughs> <up> the context. <laughs> so this mother is breastfeeding her baby and all of a sudden the phone rings. So I say, oh, the phone is ringing and she doesn't even hear it. So I completely <laughs> disturb her. Do you see, you can't teach mothers. Yeah who ignore yeah. their phones and yet mm -hmm. many mothers pounce on their phones as though that's much that's as important to breastfeeding as their breasts for some reason <laughs> and yeah and yet this mother didn't even hear her her phone because she was totally with her baby yeah so, she's locked in to that, yeah. that that bubble with her yeah yeah, yeah. so when when you are in a love relationship oftentimes you completely ignore mm -hmm. the environment around you and of course we we all have experienced that with a partner and uh and many of us have experienced that in breastfeeding we're we're just with baby <laughs> yeah yeah and it's and it is the ultimate expression of mindfulness being in the moment Mm. present yeah. with, with your baby and it is such although it can feel like it's a long time with breastfeeding isn't going well but yeah that it's gone in a blink of an eye and then you're you know you're remembering all those lovely moments you know that, yeah. that but you hope you were present for and I'm sure I'm not the only mother to think god there were times when I was not present and I was on my phone or I was I was a million miles away and I think that society has a has a lot to answer for when it comes to you know allowing mothers ha create that space so that they can just mother their baby and not have twenty different things that they feel they should be doing because society has told them they're you're not productive unless you're doing the the ten things on the checklist as well as mothering a newborn and raising a a good human. Yeah, it's, it's amazing so what we've what we've done to women. Thank you so much. Um, Suzanne, do you want to say anything about where where we can find your work and your research and books and where can we find well, you? I will be sending around this article that's going to be published in December, The Unthinking Breastfeeding, because I'm quite pleased about that. I've done a lot of writing in French. Mm -hmm. And I also am thinking about putting a lot of my research on my website. Uh, because some of the research articles you can't really find anymore. I don't know why. But I have a lot of, uh, I've written a lot of articles. I'm writing a book chapter now in French, and I'll probably translate that into into English. Great. Um, so, yeah, well, I'm just going to keep there's writing. Two. There, there's two websites. So the English one is biologicalnurturing.com. And there's loads of articles in English. Yeah loads of research articles that were published um and the french one is suzanne uh s-u-z-a-n-n-e uh hyphen. dash yeah or hyphen colson.com so okay. and, um and there are several articles in french that are already on there and we have many uh, to be added uh, yeah. because of recent um, 
Well, we're going to translate some. Yeah. With the right. biological nurturing family is growing. It is indeed. <laughs> so oh, we have lots of people who want to translate in this and that. Yeah. So that's, oh, fantastic. Because it is, I, because when I'm, uh, I read papers for in very different, in lots of different languages and I'm, I'm, I just fiddle around with Google Translate and I'm trying to make yeah. sense of, but I still feel like I'm not, I, I, I don't trust the, the translation because yeah. well, unless I've read it in English and I know what they are saying, they are saying what they mean and it's not Google and it's given it some other glance <laughs> to, and I'm like, yeah. Probably a couple of articles that are recent since 2019 concern uh, sore nipples. Because uh, certainly just using biological nurturing as a position almost yeah. reduces the incidence of sore nipples by half. Uh, when you use all the components, it reduces it more. Um, and certainly in Trieste in Italy, they're great lovers of biological nurturing. And they have written, they've uh, carried out a longitudinal study where they... Um, following birth, they followed mothers in a pediatric practice that was baby friendly. And they added biological nurturing and uh, therefore stopped teaching mothers uh, mm. from you know the first visit during the first month to three years. And at five months, they had a 66% rate of exclusive breastfeeding wow. in that pediatric practice. So that compared obviously very favorably yeah. with any other. In fact, they claim to have the highest rates for exclusive breastfeeding in uh, any country in Europe. In wow. fact, in any high income country. So um, then you have to read that article. I was not involved in, in that, which is great. A lot of uh, different people are starting to conduct research about biological nurturing and it's always coming out positive so yeah. which i'm really pleased about yeah i'm really Absolutely. chuffed because it's given me kind of the fuel to take this forward <laughs> yeah more. and it's been i mean it's been a while when I, like when i think when i first met you and and you know how it takes so long for oh new practices to actually be Maybe. implemented. So we must be coming up on that. And on, it's been a while. So are we coming up on that around that time of, is it like 17 years or that it takes for a- I'm hoping that Baby Friendly will integrate many of the biological nurturing practices. So we're working on that. We're working on that in France and England and mm -hmm. and, right. and every, it just takes a while to, yeah. to yeah. move forward for many yeah. of those uh, new it, ideas. And, that's and it is, it's so new for, for so many. Um, yeah. But as I said, when we're starting, but so old because it's, we're, we're tapping into you know, instincts and reflexes. And that's right. Yeah. It's, it's great though. I'm, but thank you both so much for, for joining me today. Was, well, this has been great. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so much for having so us. Much. Yeah, it really was lovely funny. to chat and I will include all your details and everything, websites and uh, training. Oh, I'll so, send uh, you um, all the announcements too, so that you can include them. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Cause I have the, the two articles you sent me recently and I'm, I'm I, there's just not enough hours in the day for the time yes, I want to um, spend on this. So, uh, <laughs> But I really do appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your evening in the UK okay. and Friday Indeed. night. Get your, are you having a takeout or <laughs> <laughs> someone cooked? It's like Friday night takeout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So we'll TGI see. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again for uh, you, for joining please. me and I'll, uh, I'll send you on the recording. Fabulous. Okay, brilliant.